Despite medical advances over the past 30 years, the number of people living with the AIDS virus continues to grow. That means a continued need for more research, education services, and public awareness. These are all reasons for the annual AIDS Walk and 5K Run on June 7th. Our guest is the director of the organizing group, the AIDS Action Committee, Carl Shortino. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Carl. Thanks for having me back, Chris. Uh, the number of people living with a AIDS or HIV is, is going up, but uh, what about the number of new diagnoses? So in Massachusetts, we have a pretty remarkable success story where our new infection rate has come down by roughly 41% since the year 2000. So that kind of decline was significant because the national number is flat at 50,000 per year year after year, we've been stuck. But in this state, we were seeing a decline of new infections. So it tells us that our prevention is working. And unlike most places in this country, what we need to do to get to zero seems more possible than the rest of the country. So we're excited about that. But the reality is every year that you add new people to the list of those that are living with HIV, those people need services and support uh, for life. Until there's a, a cure and a vaccine, we have those people that we need to support and take care of. So. Now, this is a disease with multiple uh, groups. In fact, it affects everybody, but, mm -hmm. but if you look at certain groups of risk, uh, is there yeah. any that you're more concerned about in terms of not being able to get the numbers down? Yeah, you know, it's a virus that it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't care whether you're black, white, Latino, gay, straight. It doesn't care. It's just a virus that infects people that get exposed. But uh, like the earliest days of the epidemic, we still see certain populations that are disproportionately impacted. So I'll give you one example in this state. The black community makes up about 6% of the state's population, but 30% of new infections. And young black gay men in particular are seeing pretty significant spikes. So our prevention work um, overall is working in bringing down new infections, but in the black gay community, there's clearly a spike as just one example. Black and Latino communities are disproportionately impacted um, and also poorly served by our current system. They, they fare the worst in terms of health outcomes once infected as well. So when you see a disparity like that, uh, how does that change the strategy for prevention? It, it's, you know, it's strange because when you think of it in clinical terms, it's a virus that you can treat and prevent just by traditional prevention methods, condom usage, for example. Um, but it's a virus that passes through social networks and sexual networks, and it, it means that your strategy for prevention and outreach and care and support needs to be thoughtful and culturally competent in those various communities. So for example, we hire peers, um, people that are living with HIV that work for AIDS Action Committee, and they will meet one-on-one -on -one and work with other people that walk in the door who are newly infected to support them. And part of the challenge is to make sure that we have peers that reflect those walking in our doors and to make sure that they are culturally competent, they can understand the needs and concerns and fears of people based on their cultural context. Um, and you can't look at it just as a monolith of everyone that's infected, take this drug and your job is done. It, it takes more sensitivity and thought than that. Of course, another part of prevention is testing. And I guess you don't have to be part of a particular population to, to really uh, maybe need to do this. No, the reality is that everyone should be tested as a part of regular primary care now with very few exceptions. And part of what we're trying to instill in the primary care context is that that's just a normal routine test that's integrated into what doctors are doing with their patients. Um, that's not the case yet in all settings, but that's the goal and that's the ideal. That's the old standard with the CDC, for example. Um, routine testing, routine testing. Now, there's also another, maybe you might call it a more aggressive kind of prevention uh, prophylaxis. So yeah. explain how that would work and, and what you need to do to get it to the people who need it. Yeah, so pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP as the shorthand is known, it's the idea of someone that's not infected with HIV taking a daily medication, the one that's approved so far is Truvada, and by taking the HIV medication as an uninfected person, you are actually uh, much less likely to actually get infected with the virus if you were to be exposed to it, more than 90% effective. It's actually more effective than most vaccines that people would take. So if you think of it, an analogy might be sort of taking a daily vaccine to prevent the infection or taking a daily birth control pill to prevent pregnancy, but in this case, it prevents the infection of HIV. Um, we're confident seeing the numbers that are coming out in the first few years of this being on the market that this could be a groundbreaking uh, tool to really break through that logjam of where we're stuck in the plateau of new infections. If you can get PrEP into communities that are at high risk for getting infected and have them uh, have the community accepted as a prevention tool, um, we're confident that'll be a significant breakthrough to make sure that we get to zero new infections. And we're starting to see it be taken out more often. No, 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 there, there are roles here for everything from healthcare providers, hospitals, uh, government programs. What about the role of the AIDS Action Committee itself? What do you do that, that's not done by the rest of that yeah. picture? 
You know, AIDS Action Committee is New England's largest and oldest AIDS service organization. We come out of a tradition of supporting those that were in the earliest days facing a death sentence. Um, our core mission today, even 30 years plus into the epidemic, is to support those that are living with the virus, to help them stay connected to care, to have the compassion and support of people that understand what they're going through. Um, that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of different uh, variations of how we do that work. But on the prevention and public education side, it does mean something 30 years into the epidemic when most people don't hear much about HIV anymore, to have an organization like AIDS Action taking the front lines and really being able to tell the story of what, a, what HIV is today. I think most people don't really understand where it is today and what, who's impacted, who's affected, who's infected. Um, and our job is to make sure that that story doesn't get lost because we need to keep talking about it. If you go into silent mode about HIV, that's where HIV will thrive and well, will rebound. One way to get that story out is your walk and run. Tell me about that. Certainly. So this is going to be the 30th AIDS walk. Uh, we have roughly 10,000 people come together every year. Uh, the fact that it's the 30th anniversary gives us a chance to tell the really the, the remarkable progress we've made since 30 years ago when um, it really truly was people walking to support their friends that were facing a death sentence. And now we can tell the story of the promise of new prevention tools and interventions. Um, Sunday, June 7th, it's in the morning. We will be at the Boston Common where the walk originally started. Uh, opening ceremony begins at nine o'clock and people are welcome to come or they can go to aidswalkboston.org to read more and, and to sign up if they'd like to register as well. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much. From the AIDS Action Committee, Carl Shortino. We'll have more news in just a moment.